Movie props are huge collectibles. The bigger the movie, the more collectible the prop. And Cleopatra was one of the biggest films of all time. This will fly off the shelf. I will have no problem finding a buyer for this. I'd like to ask you to give this video a thumbs up if you're a fan of Pawn Stars, join the notification squad by subscribing and hitting that bell notification on, but also, don't forget to comment down below saying I subscribed to enter our monthly shoutouts, and we'll make sure to reply and thank as many of you as we possibly can. Hope you enjoyed the video. As Rick said, movie props are huge collectibles, and the bigger the movie, the more collectible the prop is. Since there are people who would pay ridiculous amounts for them, it's not surprising that Pawn Stars do everything they can to get their hands on the props, providing the price is decent and that they have room to make some money. So stay tuned as we look at six times the Pawn Stars scored movie props, from shields and monster replicas to production stills and hoverboards. Notorious for its massive cost overruns and production troubles, the movie Cleopatra starring Elizabeth Taylor released in 1963 became the highest grossing movie of the year, but still managed to lose money due to its production and marketing costs. Even though it was one of Hollywood's biggest flops ever, some critics still praised the movie, disregarding the bad rep that overshadowed its quality. Considering the movie's history and everything that happened behind the scenes, Rick was naturally interested in getting his hands on the Roman shield prop from the movie that he called one of the greatest movies ever made and one of the biggest screw-ups ever made. After delivering a lesson from the history of cinema to the customer, Rick revealed how excited he is about the prop and backroom confessional, saying it will fly off the shelf and that he won't have a problem with finding a buyer. The customer explained that the shield was actually made by his father who worked as a prop master at Fox Studios, and after the movie was done, the director gave him his prop back as a reward of sorts. The certificate of authenticity left no room for doubt, so they got down to haggling. Even though the man asked for $500, Rick told him that the props don't usually go for a lot of money, but since the shield was one of the coolest he has ever seen, he offered him 300 bucks, but paid 400 in the end. Released in 1954 and directed by the king of Universal science fiction Jack Arnold, Creature from the Black Lagoon was among the first Universal movies that was filmed and originally released in 3D, requiring 3D glasses. The monster horror movie followed the fossil hunting expedition in the Amazon as they uncovered a fossilized skeletal hand with webbed fingers from the Devonian period, showing that there is a connection between land and sea animals, but unbeknown to the members of the expedition, they found themselves in the territory of prehistoric, amphibious creature Gilman, a member of humanoid species with fangs and claws that have evolved underwater. Upon their encounter with Gilman, they manage to tranquilize and capture him, but the monster manages to escape nonetheless, taking the only female member of the expedition along with it in the process. By the end of the year, the movie had already grossed over $3 million, and the aquatic monster played by Ben Chapman on land, and Rico Browning in underwater scenes, became the most iconic and influential cinematic monster of the 50s. When the man brought a replica of the famous creature from his collection to the pawn shop, signed by the man who played the creature, Corey was simply intrigued. The man explained that he bought the replica in a store in Southern California in 1998, and luckily, Ben Chapman was there signing autographs, so the man had him sign the base of his monster's replica. The reason why Gilman's replica was so cool was the fact that the monster's costume was incredibly detailed thanks to a huge team of artists, as well as sculptors in the makeup department, and until the movie was released, audiences have never seen a full-body monster costume like that. Unlike the costumes of other Universal monsters that weren't as elaborate as you always knew there was a human being behind all the makeup, like the Wolfman and Frankenstein's monster, the costume of Gilman was incredibly believable, as even the gills on it moved when it breathed. In addition to the replica, the customer also brought a short version of the film from the 50s, along with the 3D glasses to the pawn shop, which made his $2,200 asking price decent, but Corey wasn't sure about how long it would take to actually sell it. Instead, Corey offered $1,600, but since the customer wouldn't go that low, they shook hands at $1,900, and the pawn star scored a nice prop from the iconic horror movie. Each and every one of us has that one favorite movie, TV show, or whatever that holds such a special place in our hearts that we gladly go out of our way to get a piece of memorabilia or a prop related to it. Being a human being just like the rest of us, Rick also has a soft spot for one movie in particular, as we've seen in the episode titled La La Land from season 14 of Pawn Stars, where he behaved quite out of character. Ever since he saw Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory at a young age, Rick has been an avid fan of the movie's title character. 
The man that came to the shop carrying the props that were used in the movie, a golden egg, a golden ticket, Willy Wonka's hat, Wonka bars, and most important of all, the everlasting gobstopper knew this and Rick could barely contain himself. The man took advantage of Rick's love for the movie and made it crystal clear right away that Rick is going to have to pay up if he wants just one item from his collection, probably referring to the gobstopper, the item he knew Rick would want the most. Reliving childhood memories, Rick stepped out of his usual character and immediately struck a deal with the man without even trying to haggle and without investigating the authenticity of the items. Rick bought the gobstopper believing that the ultimate Wooly Wonka prop would bring customers to the shop, but at the end of the day, he got played as the price of the gobstopper actually ranges from $20 to $40,000. Still, considering that Rick is such a massive fan of the cult classic and that all the items he bought definitely are legit since they came from Julie Don Cole who played Veruca Salt in the movie, this purchase was definitely a jackpot in his book whether he later sold it or not. Considered by many critics, filmmakers and fans to be the greatest film ever made, Citizen Kane released in 1941 was actually Orson Welles' first feature film. The movie was groundbreaking in many ways and was praised for innovative lighting and focusing methods as well as dramatic editing. Interestingly, Welles was only 25 years old when he produced the film, probably unaware that his creation would influence filmmakers for decades to come. When in season 14 of Pawn Stars, a man brought in a production still from the movie signed by Orson Welles himself, Rick found it pretty damn cool. The customer explained that he stumbled upon the production still while going through the photos of his late grandfather who was a big movie buff. Since he wasn't much of a movie guy, he decided to sell it as it had no sentimental value to him. Surprisingly, the man didn't even see the movie, which gave Rick an opportunity to clue him in. Still, even though the production still was awesome, he wasn't so sure about the authenticity of Wells' signature, so he asked the man how much he was looking to sell it for. When the man said 5 grand, Rick decided to give his buddy expert a call to see if the signature is legit, because the real value of the item depended on it. The man said that seeing something like this is rare and was highly skeptical about it, but after thorough inspection concluded that it was indeed, and without question the real deal, estimating its value around $26 to $2700. With the expert's job done, Rick and the customer started haggling. The customer asked for $2200, but Rick immediately cut it down by a grand, saying that he's gonna have to frame it and whatnot. Nevertheless, the customer asked for more and Rick had no choice but to up the amount of money a bit so they sealed the deal at $1500. While Back to the Future Part 2, released in 1989, was not as successful as the first movie in the franchise, it still became notable for its 2015 setting and predictions of technology, like hoverboards. When the movie's director Robert Zemeckis joked in an interview that they were real, it caused a frenzy among the fans of the movie who rushed to local toy stores looking for it. Even though Zemeckis eventually retracted his joke, hoverboards still remained cool enough, and when a man came to the pawn shop with one signed by Christopher Lloyd, Michael J. Fox and Leia Thompson, Corey and Chumley were intrigued. While Chumley immediately asked does it float, Corey recalled the time his grandfather took him to see the movie, saying it was probably one of the first movies he remembers seeing in a theater. When the man asked $1500 for it, Corey immediately told him that he won't be able to give him that much as he was looking around 300 bucks. That was too low for the customer however, so Corey seemingly topped it out at 500 When the man still wouldn't agree to that, Corey offered 100 bucks more, doubting that he will ever make some money on it, which finally worked for the customer. Up next we have an honorable mention of sorts, simply because of what everyone believed and how the situation was handled. Back in the 70s, no one would have foreseen that the movie Godfather, based on Mario Puzo's best-selling novel of the same name and directed by Francis Ford Coppola would become a major success. It was supposed to be a cheap potboiler that Paramount Pictures thought it could produce cheaply and pick up a quick but small profit. However, thanks to Coppola's vision and his portrayal of mobsters as complex characters of actual psychological depth, the movie became an all-time classic. I mean, surely getting your hands on the movie screenplay supposedly signed by one of the cast members whose name stands carved in gold in Hollywood history would be worth of lowballing just about anyone. In this case, that anyone was a woman by the name of Diane. Another customer that was almost schemed by the gold and silver pawn shop was a woman by the name of Diane. 
In season 4, she came to the pawn shop with a bound copy of the Godfather screenplay, which wouldn't be all that interesting if it weren't for the mysterious signature of Val on the first page. Diane wanted to sell the script so she could raise funds for the charity organization, hoping it's worth $10,000. Still, without much to go on except Enigmatic Cal, everyone thinking about Al Pacino. So Rick called in a handwriting expert John who eventually confirmed the authenticity of the signature. Despite the fact that The Godfather is one of the greatest movies of all time, Rick wasn't ready to give more than $500 for it, so Diane decided to keep it. Ultimately, she managed to sell the screenplay for whopping $12,000 at a charity fundraiser, but there was a twist. After hearing about the auction, the Godfather producer stepped forward to clarify some things. His name was Al Ruddy, and he was actually the one who signed the script. Thank you for checking this video out, and don't forget to smash that like button and also subscribe for new videos every day. Turn that bell notification on and comment down below that you subscribed, and we'll make sure to reply and thank as many of you as we possibly can. Once again, thank you for watching and see you next time.